fun episode for you guys. Uh, this, this, as I'm recording this on Monday, March 22nd, Saturday, we had a great uh, live live show. We had Dr. Sorahan. She is a professor at the University of California, uh, Irvine. And we had Ben Dixon on and, and the usual Saturday crew. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, for those of you that just listen to the audio on the podcast, the Saturday crew has expanded. It's no longer just Pascal and myself. It's me, Pascal, Marcus from the left flank. That's, and, uh, and sometimes we get Paul uh, Prescott from Jacobin. So we had a, a definitely a packed house, and we uh, interrogated some some things that I, I felt weren't being covered the the, the way I, they should have been covered. These 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 uh, incidents of uh, violence that are happening uh, in the Asian community. Um, so I called on some friends to come on and, and talk about that, and we had a pretty good discussion. So this is actually just. Uh, that discussion. Uh, by the time Ben Dixon came on the show, that was an entirely different discussion, and we didn't. We might have hit on it a little bit, but we didn't really stay on it as much as this part of the discussion. Um, if you want to see the show in its entirety, um, if you go to our YouTube channel, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can be alerted every time these things come on, and you can be part of the show. When I say part of the show, you can comment or read your comments. The guests will, you know, respond to your questions. It is a good time. And these Saturday shows we do at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And they go anywhere from an hour and a half to like three hours. And right now we're calling those the quote-unquote free show. Because <laughs> those will be the shows that um, we're not going to cut it at a certain point and go Patreon only. It'll just be... All day Saturday. So if we go for five hours as we went a few weeks ago, that's five hours. Once again, if you did not know, there's links to the description. There's links to the YouTube channel uh, on wherever you're seeing this or listening this. I always say seeing this. Wherever you're hearing this, uh, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we do a live stream where we bring guests in. Um, and it's a pretty interactive show when it comes to the chat. So this is definitely a show that I think uh, more people would have loved to have been a part of. But uh, let me know what you think about this in the comments. You know, like I said, my Twitter inbox is always open if you guys want to hit me up and, and give your two cents. Uh, I, I will listen. I will respond uh, for the most part. Gonna talk shit. I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> but this this person, uh, Dr. Sora Han, and I are actually uh, friends from high school. I've known Sora for Jesus, probably going on 30 years now. And she was one of the early people I was trying to get on the show. And she doesn't really like doing this kind of uh, public speaking. Uh, so there was a bit of an arm twist. And finally, finally, she she agrees to come on the show, and it was brilliant. The show was wonderful. Um, the conversation, I think, really, again, touched on some things that we're not talking about um, when you're seeing kind of the same, <sighs> the same empty rhetoric that I'm seeing coming out of a lot of uh, the stuff I'm seeing on, on even leftist uh, media when it comes to this uh, situation of, of violence. So, sit back, get ready for a rather spicy conversation. Dr. Sora Han, Paul Prescott from Jack and Jacobin, Marcus from Left Flank Vets, and of course, Pascal and myself. Uh, the show starts off with a clip to kind of set the tone of, of the media that I was getting <laughs> kind of sick of uh, from an Al Jazeera piece. Actually, that happened before the shooting in Atlanta. Um, 
but this these reports of, of, of violence against Asian people have been going on for a while now. Um, so that's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear first uh, an Al Jazeera uh, reporter asking some people some questions, and then we kind of go right into it from there. There was no... <laughs> there wasn't even much for introductions. It was like, all right, here, here's everybody. Let's go. So thank you guys for taking the time to listen. This is Dr. Sora Han. She is a professor uh, at the University of California, Irvine. I effed up in the show and said she was at Riverside. She's at the University of California, Irvine. All right. Thank you. will be shocked when they see some of these stories. I have to share with our audience uh, the story of Vidya Ratanapati. Uh, elderly gentleman here, have a look at his picture and I'm just going to scoot up so you can see what happened to him, which is truly shocking. Unprovoked attack, pushed, he's 84 years old. What kind of, oh goodness me, what kind of attacks are you seeing? What are the stats that you have, Cynthia? Yes, so um, one thing that I wanna just share right out bat is that since we started tracking um, anti-Asian racism and xenophobia in March, we've seen uh, over 2,800 incidents of uh, racism and discrimination directed at Asian Americans. And what we're seeing is that, at least from our data, that a majority of these incidents are what we would consider verbal attacks and harassment while people are living their daily lives under the pandemic. So as essential workers, as frontline workers, uh, delivery drivers, uh, school nurses, et cetera, are being subjected um, are being dehumanized. And we are also seeing um, a category of uh, discrimination in the workplace, um, online bullying, uh, certainly in social media as an accelerator of hate. Um, and then we do have some instances of what we would consider hate crimes. So uh, being here in the Bay Area um, where we have had um, visibility on these recent attacks, it has been a very painful time for our community. And it's one of the reasons why we held actions over this past weekend to really voice our concerns, to condemn these attacks and to demand action. All right, happy Saturday, everybody. There today is going to be a, a pretty pretty good episode. We have a totally packed house today. Um, I don't even want to start with the monologue. I'm just going to bring everybody in because we have so many people. So first and foremost, let me introduce my co-host, my homie, my dog, my brother from another, Pascal Robert. My man, my brother Jason Miles. What's going on, my man? How are you living? Uh, I'm I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, I'm excited for today. Uh, let's bring in our brother from the left flank vets. He is a host of a very successful Twitch show. Um, a bunch of post 9-11 combat veterans uh, that are now leftist Marxist thinkers. He is Marcus from the left flank vets. Yo, how's it going? How's it going? Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. <laughs> and And coming all the way from Philadelphia. You may know him as the host on Jacobin. Paul 
Prescott. How's it going? Best best city in the world, Philadelphia. You forgot <laughs> you forgot to add that small part for the <laughs> You guys have no idea off air. The reason why the show started a little later is because we were having some some beef. Not even East Coast, West Coast beef. Some East East beef. Right. It's East. Well, and I say like I would say it's East on Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> and you just dropped in a line about cheesesteaks, and I couldn't even defend myself. Okay, but gotta, there's really no defense. Cheesesteak line. You got to defend yourself. First of all, it depends where you're getting a cheesesteak from. But, of course, spoken like but, a true Philadelphian. I mean, let me let me not start because let me because you said from South Philly. That's that's one thing. But anyway, I'm just gonna say this. Anytime you say something about cheesesteaks to someone from Philly, the first thing you're gonna say is, "Well, it just depends on where you go." Right. You know. But at the end of the day, is putting the can the canned cheese. That's mm-hmm. just something that's a regular thing, mm-hmm. and. I mean, like, Paul, if anyone from Ohio has something to say, all you ever have to say is that's why y'all got punk ass chili. Okay. That's the worst that's chili. Ever. Who that's put sugar in chili? Pascal, did you put sugar in chili? Damn. No. Uh, Paul, did your mom put sugar in he's chili? He's leaving. He's leaving. Who the hell does no. shit like that? Hold on. Let's bring in our host. I don't let's even put sugar in coffee. coffee. Our host. I'm sorry. Our guest today is a professor, uh, assistant professor of criminology, law, and society at the University of California, Riverside. She is also a friend of damn near 30 years, Dr. Sora Han. Hello. Good morning. Greetings uh, and good morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> Sora, do you put sugar in chili? Oh, no, no. 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 Cinnamon. No. Sweet no. ass meat. <laughs> <laughs> so one little minor correction. Oh, sorry. Your title? It's not. Oh, I said Riverside. Oh, it's no, Irvine. It's I'm sorry. And I really tell. I'm old. Uh, it's Irvine. Yes. Sorry. I Irvine. said the wrong school. Because you know why I always say Riverside? Because I've spoken to more Riverside people. And Dylan is Riverside. Yes. And I don't know why That's I get right. you too confused because they are extremely different areas in California. Very different, but also very different campuses. Yes. Representing but, different schools of thought. But anyway. Anyway, That's we point. are here today to talk hey, about you. yes can you hear me don't forget about super chats oh yeah, yeah yeah so we finally have hit monetization it looks like somebody did oh. uh put a super chat in there so thank you very much uh todd buckingham oh wow uh thank you very much uh so we finally have hit a, a point of monetization so pascal and i can actually <laughs> Pay a few bills. <laughs> yeah. So, so your super chats are are very much appreciated because this is listener funded programming here. Uh, we take no corporate money yet. Capitalism. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Capitalism Word. has occurred. Next episode, they'll bring on some lobbyists, some uh, big farmer lobbyists as guests. Well, see, I think I want to yes. do you one better, Paul. <laughs> All of a sudden, the camera's a lot clearer on the next one. Right? I, I actually want to do you one better. It's like, I think that eventually, so left flank as a bunch of uh, leftist veterans are eventually going to get bought out by like Raytheon. Oh, uh, right, right. And then just start talking about, <laughs> well, you see, you save lives by this new bomb that's got right. 30 like, knives. Maybe that drones out aren't that bad, really, yeah. when you think about it. You could, you could, you could hella tell, you could hella tell too when like uh, people take the bag because all of a sudden the narrative changes a lot. They're like, Joe Biden is doing good work. I don't know why everybody's complaining about Joe Biden. Everybody worries about the bomb victims. No one ever is really concerned about the bomb makers. Those are good American <laughs> jobs. <laughs> there was that, there was that story in uh, in Richmond uh, where we're talking about. I think we're talking about last week where the where the 
the people that did drugs and their, their baby died. And the whole, not the whole story, but a lot of it centered around the feelings of the police officers that had to find the, the dead child and not mm. the parents. It was like the police officers are, are parents first and police officers second. Yeah. What? So I was like, wow, <laughs> that's an interesting narrative. Maybe they should stay home and take care of the damn kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so there's, it, Marcus and I have definitely talked about it a lot. Pascal and I have definitely talked about it a lot. And, uh, Sora and I have stayed up late texting back and forth, uh, talking about the, the incidents in, in Atlanta or the incident in Atlanta, uh, quite a bit from the media coverage, um, to the backlash. Um, and, and when I was trying to put this episode together, I was trying to take a, a different angle. Um, on how we should look at situations like this because the first thing that happens and actually what happened in Atlanta is you get an increased police presence right and that's never good um, but there's also the fear if, if I'm in that environment I'd be a little shook I mean somebody just came in and, and shot the place up and generally what happens is the citizens call for a increased police presence but um if we go back and look at incidents similar to this that have happened, that police crackdown leads to newer and tougher laws that never really stop anything, don't really help. Um, do you want to say something, Pascal? No, I'm, I'm listening. Oh, you're just listening? Oh, okay, you had that look like you were about to say something. So that's why we bring in our, our uh, I wouldn't say, would you call yourself a, an expert, Sora? Can we call you an expert yet? Can you just call anybody an I, expert? No, I, I don't <laughs> like that term. I actually hate experts. I don't like But you like actually that worked term. in the abolition world for some time. I did. I did. And you did um, study with uh, Angela Davis? Yes, I, I did. Um, my doctoral training with Angela Davis seems like ages ago. Um, but was. I, I was actually was. involved in, yes, it, <laughs> in critical resistance here in the Bay Area when it, mm -hmm. it first launched. And, um, and I think relevant for our discussion today, I'm involved in drafting a joint statement between critical resistance and insight women of color against violence. Um, Gosh, I can't remember the year now, but this was a collaborative, a collaborative statement, sort of trying to think about how women respond to violence and how to um, create the, a terrain, which we actually hear now, where when we have events like these in Atlanta, we give our public and our organizations a way to respond um, and seek solutions that don't add to um, the police state. And I think that we see some of that um, language in the, in the recent response. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to even just jump on the comment that uh, I think it was like Sam Jones had just made. Uh, in the response to the uh, UK police officer uh, murdering uh, was it Sever Sarah, I can't remember the last name, it starts with an E, and the response was to put more like plainclothes police officers and things of that nature. And I think, and Jason had mentioned earlier this morning, that in the same way, there had been a heightened police response um, in Atlanta to these these murders. So, um I think they've kind of already gone into the to the realm that you were just speaking out against. Uh, and I don't know, <laughs> is <laughs> I guess is there a, a way to, you know, stop that? And you know, or at least you know, where, I guess where do we go from here? Knowing though that they've already crossed that line in a sense. Well, this is. Um, I think that certainly abolitionist abolitionist organizations have been working on this for a very long time. Um, you'll hear that many of the activists are sort of saying, you know, give us, give us, you know, resources, support our efforts to create safety um, within our communities, as opposed to 
um, increasing budgets for policing or reforming policing to offer more sensitive, culturally sensitive um, policing. And this is a way to not only sort of register a critique of what is inevitably happening, um, but also to um, widen the sort of possibility of a more radical response from within the Asian American community and within the sort of consortium of Asian American organizations, which we also know, I think maybe this was a couple of weeks ago, has an amazing range in terms of its um, political ideologies spanning from um, a kind of third world radicalism um, to really right wing um, Christian, you know, sort of positions that are right lockstep with the Trumpists. Um, so that's the kind of ideological terrain that I see many of the activists who've been um, making public statements and writing opinion pieces, that, that that's where they're trying to intervene. Um, how to actually create a situation um, where it's, it's sort of a kind of seamless transition into more policing in the area. Honestly, I think that the best lesson for this is the Black Lives Matter protests from the past summer and um, the history of Black radical politics, where it takes, it takes people demonstrating in the streets. It takes mass mobilization in the streets to, to effectively resist um, that kind of consolidation of police power. Now, there's there's been a lot of people talking about, and, and Joanna says it right here in the chat, that there's a lot of uh, anti-Asian sentiment uh, and on a bipartisan level. I don't know if you guys uh, are noticing that uh, from Donald Trump definitely was over the top with with his almost to a insultingly comic level, whereas Joe Biden, to me, stands firm on the on the U.S. standard Cold War policy and uh, anti-China level. Um do you think that plays any part of this, uh, Paul? Well, I was going to say on, on Biden, um, you know, even he's been framing his infrastructure plan. And I've, of course, I would support an infrastructure overhaul that's needed, but he's been framing it in terms of competition with China. Mm -hmm. And it's like everything has, you know, and he's not sure. Of course, he's not doing that in the same way that Trump is. He's not doing it like as vulgar a way that mm -hmm. Trump, but like everything is like, well, we, you know, we don't need to do infrastructure because we need infrastructure. We need it because China's is better and they're <laughs> overtaking it. And like that, you know, from the stuff I've been reading mm -hmm. on the plan, that's, that is what he's doing. Um, you know, I can't claim to know exactly in every case in terms of in every hate crime, how much of that stuff is directly connected or not. But like, you know, the, the Democrats have definitely been fear mongering on China, just both militarily and then like domestically. And this also comes up sometimes, you know, in the labor movement um, around like buy American campaigns. And, you know, I'm all for saying we should buy union made products, but sometimes the way it's framed in certain areas of the labor movement is essentially framed in an anti-China way. And it's really missing the point of like who the enemy is, because at the end of the day, we know it's often U.S. companies or multinational companies that are making the choice to move a job to a, a, another place, whether that's China or anywhere else, to get to lower wages and get around unions. So like, of course, the enemy there is not the Chinese worker that's going to work at a job that's available. The enemy is that multinational company. But, you know, so when it's framed exclusively on Buy American, I think it, whether the intended consequences, this or not, it, it leads many American workers to kind of like just adopt anti-China attitude, um, just kind of wholesale, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Pascal, did you want to add something? No, I mean, I definitely think that with the influx of, with the coming of the Trump administration, you know, the, the uh, nativism is kind of the political posture of America overall, not exclusively with China, but we see that with Mexicans, with Mex with Mexicans and other immigrant groups, but definitely with the, you know, kind of, uh, belief that China presents some kind of existential threat. Also in the wake of the uh, the uh, coronavirus with Trump, you know, dispatching of terms like, you know, the, you know, the Wuhan virus or the China virus, that you know, logical that uh, perception that, that 
China spilling over into Asia are, you know, is a contemporary reality, but we have to realize that this is not a new phenomenon in the context of American history in terms of xenophobia or an antagonism towards uh, Asians or Chinese. We can go back to the Chinese Exclusion Act. We can go back to the, you know, the building of the railroads. There is a long history in the context of American society to demonizing uh, Asian people that is not alien to the way in which our society functions. But what's interesting to me is that how exactly this current media depiction of the Asian community as the victims under siege, under attack, juxtapose, juxtaposes with the model, model minority mythology of the Asian community as being the community on economic ascent in the United States. And how exactly do we reconcile those two perceptions in the way in which they are being, you know, the media is depicting the contemporary phenomenon that we're seeing now. That because I'm seeing in different communities of color, uh, whether it's the black community or other an immigrant community, you know, comments of people talking about, well, you know, the Asian community they have they, they have more money than white people, or they're doing better than anyone else. So there's almost this kind of inability to view them as victims because of you know their social or class, their perceived social or class status. And I'm, you know, there's a whole range of reactions I'm seeing, particularly in the black community, in terms of challenging this questions of solidarity on very, very reactionary terms based on, you know, quid pro quo, you know, when do they stand with us? Or, you know, how have they stood with us? So there's a lot of really interesting internal kind of uh, ethnic people of color dynamics that are, I see brewing reacting to this particular phenomenon. So I don't mean to prolong the question. I'd like to hear what people no, say. No, 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 that was a, that was a great question. Sora? Yeah, um, that an excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up, Pascal. I, you know, I, so what you're saying about how the this sort of history of anti-Asian violence and discrimination and its, its kind of structural relationship yeah. with the United States geopolitical relationship with the sort of rise and development of um, capitalism in, in, in Asia, I think is a really important in mind. I think one of our um, audience members, I think MJ, the, the, the comment has now passed my, my scroll, um, noted how important it is to keep those kind of geopolitical considerations in mind. And that is absolutely a part of this um, long history that people are constantly referring to, um, to have a better, more structural analysis of what is going on now. At the same time, and I think, Pascal, this is what you're trying to get at, right? As Asian organizations here, Asian immigrant groups here as Asian American organizations here start to, um, you know, sort of get invited into the spotlight to present an analysis. We've, we've not necessarily seen um, the, the kind of articulation that, that I think, you know, is being expressed here with the, the kind of ambivalence that maybe Black um, communities and, and organizations are feeling, which is, you know, how do we relate to, in a sense, one of the theories used and circulated widely is this sort of like in-between position that Asian immigrants and Asian uh, American communities occupy in the racial hierarchy of whiteness and blackness in, in the United States. And, <clears throat> you know, I specifically have been thinking about this and sort of, um, wanted to come on the show and sort of open this question as a question that we should honestly think about. Um, so for example, if we take the response to the Atlanta shootings, um, what we see is a kind of claiming of the identity of the victims as the launching point for understanding what this violence is. Um, and that is a, a, a kind of classic strategy um, in, in mobilization, and you can see the mobilization of the organizations. At the same time, how to articulate that identity 
in the South, for example, is is a, it 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 um, invites a different set of history. So my immediate sort of set of questions is in addition to the histories of wars that the United States has waged, you know, in Asia, um, what is the history of the sexual economy of violence in the South, right? That is a mm -hmm. very different history that's introduced. And by virtue of this event taking place in the South, it absolutely should um, inform our response and the way that we think about um, moving forward in terms of Asian American and African American Black organizations being able to, again, pursue a much more radical abolitionist response. Well, let, let me ask you this, uh, Sora, and I'll ask this to all the panel. Does this shooting make us shine a brighter light maybe on, on um, sex work? Because one thing about the shooting, and, and I and I shared the video. I know I shared it with Paul uh, either early this morning <laughs> or late last night, and I think I shared it with with you guys. I don't know if you guys saw it. There was a, a woman on a Democracy Now that was trying to describe the conditions in which these women, some of them that got killed in, were living in inside of the massage parlor, and at a certain point, like stop short of saying they're slave like conditions because these people were living inside here and had to work there for God knows how much money. It was pretty horrible conditions, but those were conditions that were brought on them by people that looked like them. This is a very important thing you're bringing up here, Jason, because one of the things that seems to be lacking and, and by the way, this, this, again, we realize that this happens in the way America covers all communities, but even in the black community, right? That there's this assumption that there's one particular class of individuals, usually an elite class, that represents the collective interest of everyone else. I don't see any attempt to com complicate this Asian narrative within the class hierarchy with internally Asian society that like these people were, the women who were killed were obviously clearly poor they don't fulfill that kind of modern mo that model minority mythology how is that resonating internally in terms of how they're being viewed not only by the media but within the asian community and why is there discussion in terms of how internal class hierarchy within the asian community helps facilitate the type of exploitation we see of these workers that's a, i think it's a very important point and of course, as people who are somewhat on the left, I don't think we can expect mainstream corporate media to make these kind of analyses, but I frankly haven't seen anyone interrogate this particular event from that perspective, and I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. Uh, Go for it. Should I? <laughs> well, I mean, we brought you here for a reason, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me just say, I, you know, I, um, I, I, you know, really am sort of weighing in as, as a researcher, mm -hmm. um, a researcher who is, who's really, you know, kind of immersed myself in the study of, of the history of American law. Um, and so I, I, um, I guess I hesitate sort of making any kind of prescriptions to activist organizations and, and my thoughts really are sort of engaging with what are the key terms that are emerging in the response, right? Um, and and how do those terms either narrow or widen the scope of po political possibility? And um, there, correct me if I'm wrong, Pascal, but there really hasn't been a discussion of the model minority. I mean, and this is the reason why you know, when there was that statement circulated, I can't remember the name of the organization that circulated how, you know, um, critical race theory, this particular sort of genre of, of knowledge from within legal studies about the history of race and racism in, in American law is, is, is anti-Asian, right? That, that is a sort of um, uh, a way in which we could register the model minority. So they, 
these are organizations that would really sort of embody and take on the model my model minority status and say, hey, look, we did it. Why can't everybody else? Mm -hmm. And that definitely is leverage against um, the kinds of organizations that have been stepping up to, um, you know, advance issue, issues of gender equality and sex workers' rights, et cetera, et cetera. So that internal class differentiation is very, very important. Um, I think it, it manifests in the response around the shooting in the sense that we don't hear um, too much of the kind of Asian American organizations who really defend the model minority myth um, weighing in. But I think we will actually see more of it and how it will actually play into the, the discussion. It will, um, I, I don't want to sort of make predictions, but the, the forms of historical events that are being referenced, um, there's the Vincent Chin um, assault in Detroit that I think many of our audience know about. He um, was attacked by two white men who, um, you know, were angry about at the time the sort of deindustrialization we saw in American automaking. Um, and attacked Vincent Chin. Um, and that that is sort of entering into our political discourse, as well as the kind of surveillance and the construction of the foreigner in a specific um, sector of the of, of Asian immigrant sort of migration to the United States. And those are um, the kind of um, much more professional sort of bourgeois um, capitalized sectors of immigrant communities, Asian immigrant communities. And so we're gonna, we're gonna start to see an occasion for us to have to reassert that if we're going to articulate a radical racial politics stemming from these recent events of anti-Asian um, hate, then it needs to actually start with and center, um, you know, women like those who were killed um, um, a few days ago. And where the question is, where do we get that class perspective? What, what kinds of resources and histories do we draw to get that kind of class perspective? I would say that you know, that's where the um, relation between Asian American organizations and African American organizations is crucial. Because if we see, if we've seen um, anything from this long history of racism in the United States, it's black radicalism that has really sort of created the space and held the space open for that um, class perspective that you're talking about. Well, l let me ask you and you and oh, well, I'm always asking everybody this question. Um, but so do you think there's a bit of a, of the race pimps are coming out at this point? Like, do you, are you thinking that Pascal, that what we're seeing right here? You mean like the, the Asian version of our race pimps or our own yeah. tradition? <sighs> Yeah, yeah, is there an yeah, Al Aiden Sharpton? Is there yeah. A... <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm asking the question. I don't know. I'm asking. I'm not saying it's a very good know. question. I, no, Jason, that's not an insignificant question, right? Because we've talked ad nauseum on this show. I don't think we talk when we talk about it consistently about mm -hmm. how the the leadership apparatus within the black community is a class is a class manifestation of a tier or the black political class or black misleadership class or whatever you want to call them, basically being uh, in what in in uh, third world studies they would call compradors. Or in other words, they are functionaries of the ruling class who use racial unity as an illusion to cover their role as basically, basically implementing an agenda of the ruling class under the charade of black unity. So. The question becomes, and this is a long stand, as we had Preston Smith on the show talk about how this is a long standing uh, reality that has existed in the African American kind of political paradigm. The question becomes, right, is that does this exist in the Asian community? Is there an Asian political class? Yeah. Now, now, I am not cognizant 
of, you know, I don't know, I don't believe that there is an Al Sharpton for the Asian community or a Jesse Jackson for the Asian I community. Oh no. And I think that part of the Andrew reason Yang wants to take that man along. I think part of the reason why we have not traditionally seen that, right, is that the perception, and the key word is perception, is that the Asians are doing well. They're kicking off, you know what I'm saying? They don't have all these other problems. As a matter of fact, let's be very blunt. When we do in the recent, uh, and recently when we have seen conversations with the Asian community around political function uh, events outside of uh, this these these racial uh, antagonisms, they've been about things like challenging affirmative action, questioning uh, you know the relationship between Asians and merit and hierarchy in universities, which have been antagonistic to uh, things that have been very important to the African American community, and there is, and I've seen this, a kind of belief that these people don't need help. They are the community on, they are the ascended community. So people, I see people posting uh, charts about wealth gap. Look at the Asian white wealth. They got more money than white people. They would say, why do they need our help? So there are all of these kind of complicated perceptions about, you know, the, the Asian community vis-a-vis other, you know, oppressed communities of color, if you will. And I'm, I would like to know, is there a burgeoning leadership strata in the Asian community that exists similar to the black political class, if you will. Paul, did you want to jump in? You look like you want to say something. Yeah. Well, it's not a direct response to that question. I can wait. It's not go, more ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I mean, to the earlier question of like, you know, where, where can the class perspective come from? Mm-hmm. And, and this is a big problem I'm seeing. And it's not, of course, it's not unique to Asian Americans. This is for everyone that about the NGOization or the non-profitization, whatever you want to call it, of politics. And like our political institutions and organizations are hollowed out. And mm-hmm. they're being replaced by these nonprofits and NGOs that are never going to really center the class narrative. And that, and that's the issue. I mean, think think back to the civil rights movement. The main organizations that were carrying that forward were mass membership, dues-paying organizations. I mean, for one, the labor movement was crucial. But organizations, and not that these are perfect groups, but NLBACP, SNCC, uh, CORE, um, you know, the, even Black Panther Party, you know, these are actual real political organizations where you're paying dues, you are a member, even the Democratic Party, which is not a real party in that sense, but, you know, <laughs> where politics was happening has also been hollowed out. Mm-hmm. And I think that really is where you're going to get the true class perspective, because it, 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 these are organizations that come from a class and are, you know, ostensibly maintained by that class financially and, and organizationally. So, you know, I don't, and that's why I don't think automatically the the idea is like, well, if they're working with the existing black organizations, and I think we might talk about this later with Black Lives yeah. Matter, but you see the same problem coming up. It's it's they're attempting to do this through a hodgepodge of nonprofits. And I and I don't think when we have made progress, it has been done that way. I think we need other political institutions that have been hollowed out over so long. I think that's where you will get the class perspective. I don't I just don't really expect it from the existing like constellation of 10 million nonprofits doing 10, 10 million things, if that makes sense. I, I think last night we called it the NGO. Do we call it the NGO industrial complex? Yeah, yeah. the non the nonprofit right. industrial and it's a, complex. I mean, and this yeah. is something like it really keeps me up at night. It's and it, it's become the new common sense of like from it and I, I'm not trying to say if you work for a nonprofit, you're a bad person. Like very well meaning no. people, but the tools that we once had to really get the things we want to get done. Mm-hmm. It's not that they're not there anymore, but they've been hollowed out, and it's just common sense of like, oh, you, you got to do a nonprofit. That's how you. That's how you make change. That's how you're a thought leader. It's and it's a really bad. It's just a bad culture of political activism yeah. that we gotta mm-hmm. we 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 can't go that route. It's just not going to come from that route. It never has. Again, I think the civil rights movement is a great example of that. The labor movement. You know, mm-hmm. when we've seen these reforms, it's it's. You can't like short circuit or shortcut that process. Marcus, I think, to- yeah, I mean, I think that what Paul is saying is uh, like exactly kind of on the head. And um, 
when I think, and as I, you know, I was saying on the pre-show, like it was like kind of the first thing that I thought was, I no longer want to try and do this zoom in on this specific incident, you know, this, you know, this tragic fucking this series of murders, um, to try and you know extrapolate this is what we need to do next, right? I think it's better just understand that um, there's a lot of narratives at play. You know, but there's a few that we can understand that that absolutely need to be taken uh, taken apart. You know, and I think Sword hit it, uh, hit on it before, where you know, how are we looking at the history of the United States military and, and foreign policy, um, and how do those structures now play into how people immigrate to this country and how do they fit into our society? Um, and then yeah, going further into how how do people empower themselves? And you know, yeah, one to mirror what Paul's saying, hey, if you work in a nonprofit, you know, like they're not saying you're a bad person or anything like that. But like, but honestly, we live in a capitalist society. So almost everywhere that we work, as you know, the proverbial we mm -hmm. is engaging in some sort of exploitation in one way or another right if you're just even participating as the exploitee um and so yes like and that's that's uh, that's where i think the, the actual effort you know needs to be done is organizing in a way that dismantles the military industrial complex because this, this is the stuff that i see every day is almost yeah easily every day there's march multiple ar articles in the defense and national security sphere that are directly um, geared at provoking a war with China. Um, mm -hmm. And and how do these things <laughs> play into, into roles and how people are viewed in society? Um, and then just on the basic, if people's material conditions are not met because we live in a society that generally oppresses almost all of the working class, you know, people are going to end up in situations where they have to live in this massage parlor, you know, and engage in, in, in labor that they mo probably wouldn't in their, had. in their twilight years. Let's also add that. These yeah. People are and that's in and, their, in their twilight yeah. years. This is not, these aren't spring chickens, uh, which these, is these are older women. Something that like, it was really hitting me is that for, for one of these ladies and the, her son had spoken out and say that she used to be a teacher mm -hmm. in Korea and you know coming here and this is all this is all the work she was able to find and you know but this is a lady in their fit most of these women were old enough to be this dude's mom or grandmother mm -hmm. so yeah there's a lot of uh there's a lot of things i think that are just like screaming out from this incident but i don't think looking at it as a catalyst to some different action that we need to do you know, is, is a good way to think about it. I think, you know, zooming out, understanding that, you know, there, this, there's multiple structures at play here. And, you know, kind of what Paul was alluding to is that building organizations that actually can tackle the bigger, you know, problems is, is probably a more useful. Well, also, are tackle. we in the age of, and I've been, we've been having this conversation definitely off air and I'll go ahead and do it on air. Uh, are, I feel like in the post Trump news cycle sphere, you know, people really loved Donald Trump because he was great for clicks. Um, not to say that these things aren't horrific, but some of these incidents that are being proven not racially motivated are being thrown into the fire of racially motivated incidents. And the hashtag activism doesn't really get at any of these issues that we're talking about. Like th so, everything we're saying right now, you can't fit into a hashtag. Yeah. That's right. And, and yet, you know, going to Paul's point, many um, nonprofit organizations today that stand in as the voice of whatever community, mm -hmm. this is the sphere in which they are trying to intervene in a political discourse without sufficiently sort of understanding that, um, you know, there's there's a profound limit 
to um, the medium that is being used, right? And so already we can see the news cycle sort of moving on. Um, I, I want to go back to the question that Pascal put on the table, really, because I think it's maybe one of the most urgent questions that we have to tackle at this moment. I'm not sure that we will come up with something that is um, different from what we've seen in the past, but you know, I want to really recognize what P Pascal is saying here, which is that you know, we need to have a class politics, but also within a kind of class solidarity that we might be able to forge if we could unseat the sort of, um, you know, the, the kind of centrality of the ways in which a middle class bourgeois or elite kind of political class kind of rises and dominates the, the, the sort of um, public sphere is that, one of the things that we see, even if we were to be able to create a much more stable space for um, a class solidarity across Black and Asians, right? So rejecting any sort of um, uh, articulation of an Asian American position um, from, from this uh, idea that many want to put forward today, which is that, you know, we need to, that the Asian Americans suffer discrimination too, as if that is not something that is fraught with class, okay? Um, what we see, and this is a structural matter, what we see, and I've actually written about this case, it's a, um, it's a, it's a educational segregation case, um, Gong Wan v. Rice in Mississippi, I think it was 1932, where you know a Chinese family was trying to argue that their their um, their child should be sent to the white schools um, because they are not black, right? In a default wow. situation in segregation, in which because they were not white, they would go to the black schools, and you know many. Asian American activists and thinkers today would want to sort of say, well, this is an example of how Asian Americans occupy this very kind of like in between status between black and white. They're actually oppressed and excluded from, um, a, you know, a kind of viable political position because they're excluded from the position of black and white. They're neither black nor, nor white. I'm interested in sort of thinking about how that betweenness fails to, uh, you know, is an excuse for Asian American um, activists and organizations to actually confront how, when put in that structural position, Asian Americans have often chosen to be seen as white, right? In this situation, they were saying, you know, we're not black, so we should go to the white schools. Um, and this is antithetical to the way that a, a kind of black radical politics has articulated itself. I, I hear Pascal, you know, you're challenging the sort of internal class differentiation within black politics, but nonetheless, right? When we think about the civil rights movement, when we think about um, the black power movement, that is a critique that benefits everybody versus the kind of claiming of rights and the claiming of voice of Asian Americans historically and today that want to claim it for themselves, meaning this is our moment. And when Asian American you know, organizations do this, it really does sort of unearth this antagonism that is there in, in our history. So how do we actually you know, work our work ourselves, and by this I mean Asian American, uh, work ourselves out of that position, out of that structural position, and that, that historical sort of habit of choosing whiteness. And and I think that you know part of what I was sort of alluding to was to make reference to the fact that these victims um, of the recent shooting were their lives were lost in a sexual economy of anti-blackness in the south which has a long-standing history of 
um, sexualizing and disappearing black women um, and actually was founded in one of the most insidious sort of sexual economies, um, plantation slavery, right? And so when we're able to pivot like that, not worrying actually with sort of having to bring, you know, the sort of model minority identified Asian Americans along with us, not choosing whiteness, but thinking about how to relate with blackness, then I think we have the possibility of some um, different kind of politics. Uh, but so I, 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 you know, other than that- There's um, some black people that want to respond. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I actually want to address that is that, you know, as absolutely true and salient the, the, that the uh, narrative that you shared about the history of the South is in terms of where this happens, this also happens in a city that's absolutely completely controlled by a black political class. You know, that, you know, you know, and, and, and that you have an elite, you know, when we're talking about, I'm seeing all these articles that are saying things about this case watch whiteness work, watch whiteness work. I was like, this is a black city run by black people. Think about watch whiteness work. <laughs> you know, the, the whole, you know, the whole in, internal infrastructure of uh, Atlanta is run and has been by, by, by black people. That's another aspect of this narrative that is not being complicated or discussed enough in terms of how this case is proceeding. You know, internally within the politics. Is, is it just because it, it needs to be oversimplified again for the media sphere to have something to, to feed to the hungry public, right? White guy shoots Asian ladies. He also shot some other people, but he shoots Asian ladies. So there's a racist white guy. The cop isn't the best dude and apparently had a shirt that said China virus. Guy had a bad day. So we forget everything else. Everything you just said doesn't even come up in any discussion that I've been hearing. And I've been listening to way too much about this case and the others. Well, I don't think we can expect corporate commercial capitalists. You can interrupt Pascal, sorry, it's fine. To, to, complicate, <laughs> no, I wouldn't hear what to complicate these narratives in the way that if we actually had a real left mm -hmm. that we would be doing, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I think that we should not be expecting mainstream media to do the job that people like ourselves, if we were effective, should be doing to complicate these narratives, frankly. I mean, I think this is something that, I mean, even though Democracy Now! is a foundation kind of creation, we should be hearing left voices going on the alternative media spaces that we have make these kind of more nuanced analyses. And we, you know, we don't hear it. This is why This Is Revolution is an important podcast. Please subscribe, <laughs> hit the bell, and subscribe to our bell. You're welcome. You know, because these, you know, we have to really complicate the kind of media pablum that we're getting mm -hmm. about these events to make people understand. I'm like, oh, there's a lot more sophisticated nuance involved in what's happening here. And I haven't seen anyone discuss the small level of nuance that we've shared on this show thus far. The internal class politics of the Asian community relative to these neighborhoods, the class politics of this happening in a black community with a black political class, the role of the Asian community being viewed as model minorities and how that complicates them being viewed as victims, how black Asian solidarity is complicated by historical anxieties about positionality and merit through, through affirmative action cases and things of that nature. None of this conversation is happening anywhere from what I've seen. And it it's the lack of communication about this is just allowing reactionary nativism in all segments, even in the black community, mm -hmm. have people make really, really ridiculous statements that is not going to foster the kind of solidarity needed to challenge this type of violence. Do you think it's because people are afraid to talk about this on a deeper level because the deeper you get, the more you can't kind of hang on to your narratives of white man bad? Because if you go into the place, you know, it's owned by, you know, Asians they are being pimped by Asians. That's probably not part of the narrative that they want to tell. Again, like you said about the political uh, uh, machine in Atlanta is a black political machine all the way through. 
Um, so well, do you is- think that's the reason why? I think it's simply because capitalism will never use me- its mechanisms to challenge its internal workings, particularly in the media, which means they're not going to hide. They're not going to illustrate how class internal stratification within communities of color is helping facilitate a narrative that absolves people of responsibility for these actions because it's not in their material interest because then you're going to have to stop people questioning the tools that they use that allows them. Do you, do you think that they want to have black people challenging the black political class? Do you think that they want to have poor and working class Asians who are not getting into Stanford talking about how, you know, these people don't represent us. Andrew Yang is not my, he's, he does not represent me. Damn. Well, I don't know. I, and I, somebody that goes to you, ask, what do you ask earlier? Is like, is there even an existence of, you know, a political class for Asian Americans that is able to be co opted by, you know, the mechanisms of capitalism to disrupt or even generate their own narrative? Or is that something that, like, the media will just do on its own because that's just what it does? You know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like even if with if it, whether it exists or not, you know, that Asian political class, <laughs> it the mechanism to capitalism will fill that hole on all on its own. Mm-hmm. And I think we see that in coming from the media, coming from the response of the black political class that runs Atlanta, is that there's kind of like the mo- modus operandi that is, you know, more police, you know, do some candlelight vigils, uh, make sure the donations go to the nonprofit indis- industrial complex. And then, you know, hopefully by Monday, mm-hmm. uh, either, you know, Joe Biden trips down another flight of stairs or Trump does something. And, th- you know, the, the cycle moves on without any actual analysis work done. To combat the structures that that create these these things, mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely, Marcus, and and I think that this is part of the reason why, you know, a structural analysis is so important, right? Because in a structural analysis, what we're talking about are, are positions, right? And we're we're in a moment now where the people who can occupy these positions. Um, sort of, you know, as a set, want to present a, an idea of the United States as very much um, uh, uh, inclusive and and with Biden's appointments, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and so part of radical organizing and, you know, when I was thinking earlier this morning about well, you know, the title of the show, This is Revolution, and, and how do I actually relate to that today? And I'm like, well, the, my first answer is, like, how do we actually start off, like, revolutions of thought, right? Sort of revolutions of thought, tr- you know, throwing off these really traditional and tired ways of talking and thinking about these issues. Um I think that this, so when in, in Atlanta, we're dealing with a kind of multiracial or even black political elite, we still returning to a structural analysis, understand that they're occupying a certain position as are Asian American organizations. Um, and, and despite those positions we occupy, how do we insist on um, relating differently? And, and I, and I, you know, I'm sort of hopeful about that. Um, But that kind of alternative way of relating and thinking and talking like we're doing now, actually requires first working through these, um, these real divisions and these real antagonisms that um, impede any kind of effective mobilization. And when I talk about effective mobilization, I'm not talking about who we're going to put in office, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking about, you know, the kinds of um, resources that we gather to support um, the most vulnerable in whatever communities we live in. Paul, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, something Sora said earlier kind of got me thinking about, you know, I think because you were kind of posing the questions how to do this work in a position of solidarity. Um, and not sort of antagonism. And it made me think about some of the organizing around 
public education going on in Philadelphia and how you have, there are a few um, Asian American student groups like Asian American Students United, another group called Viet Lead, you know, they, and they're working in the context of this broader movement of funding for public education overall and supporting public education. And, you know, I think there are certain campaigns and movements that lend itself to that more, I won't, I won't say automatically, but, you know, more naturally than others. And I think something like public ed is an example where they're organizing in that context of other people in their same situation of going to underfunded public schools. Um, and, you know, they're fighting under that heading with other people for those same things. And at the same time, you know, these organizations allow them to pursue certain specific problems that they might be facing in that context, such as, I think, I remember recently them doing campaigns around anti-Asian bullying in schools. And, but, you know, they're kind of doing that with the message of like, you know, our schools need to be safer overall through more funding to deal with these issues, not in the sense of like, we're attacking black students who might be bullying Asian students, if you know what I mean. So, um, so I, I, I that kind of goes back to what campaigns are we choosing that kind of imply solidarity already and, and make that easier to take up. And, um, you know, and I honestly, I mean, that takes me back to, I hate to like kind of shoehorn this in there, but even to the Bernie Sanders campaign around those kind of issues put us on better terrain to build solidarity with each other. Some issues lend itself to that and some issues don't. And I think what Jason's kind of getting to how the media narrative has changed and like Tore Reid has said this recently, and I know it sounds kind of conspiratorial, but it's like, you know, right after Bernie, when he, that campaign successfully raised issues of inequality in different forms consistently, you know, now after him, they they're pivoting and I think, you know, and that allows like Amazon to donate millions of dollars to these social justice organizations, again, many nonprofits and NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, but allows them to pivot away from that and turn everything back into uh, what they call the great awakening, uh, you know, in different ways. So I think you're kind of witnessing this pivot and like they finally got the opportunity to do this now that the election is over, you know, and the issues Bernie was raising are not still there. But yeah, I, I think that question of, um, how to be doing this work in solidarity. I think certain movements and campaigns lend itself to that, such as things that everyone were kind of in this together fighting for, such as public education. And I don't know if, you know, I feel like just even making the, hitting the, the point of like the importance of creating a community that is safe, even, you know, like if you're going for a specific group, safe for, you know, some specific community, but as far as the goal um, or where you're trying to get to is something that's actually beneficial to all, right? So like like you're saying, you know, like the, you know, what was the Viet lead? I'm mm -hmm. sure that that group, you know, that organization was largely, you know, probably coalition of uh, Vietnamese Americans. However, right. you're saying like they're organizing the goal is something that's broad brush strokes, you know? And I think that's, you know, I don't know, basically the difference in, radical organizations you know that going back to you know fred hampton rainbow coalition type stuff where having to organize and create a safe place for a certain community does not stop you working in solidarity mm -hmm. speaking of working in solidarity um sora you have a very storied history with a extremely popular media figure uh van jones <laughs> i mean <Mic> drop. All, <laughs> all i can say was when i was a student activist you know van jones came onto campus with his group storm and really tried to you know Fuck take over up. what the students had organized um and that's about as far as my interaction with him goes just to cussed him out just to say just to say that he has a you know his ascendancy mm -hmm. both politically and in, in terms of his media presence goes way back and is very much on the backs of um the actual people involved in organizing these um confrontations you know for us it was the university we were um, defending, you know, 
the sort of history of third world liberation and the, 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 the Department of Ethnic Studies at that time. Um, this was 1998 or something like that. Um, and, and so that, that's all I have to say, really. Oh, it's you're a not nice gonna, okay. way of, it's well. a nice way of saying what I said to you. Oh, Dylan man. came on the show. Dylan came on the show and 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 definitely went on a bit of a, a tirade uh similar to yours that I found extremely entertaining and hilarious. And I'm De saddened to the fact that the world will never get to hear Dr. Han curse like a sailor. Is this when, <laughs> is this when he was pretending to be a Maoist? This is <laughs> Who, Van Jones? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, that's when he was pretending to be an abolitionist. Oh, okay. He, yeah. He does I have mean, a, I, I don't know much about Van Jones, but like he, he does kind of very interestingly try to play every side. You know, and really like position himself in so many. The definition of a politician. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but he does it, it it's, it's kind of strange. Sora was all mad. She goes, who takes anyone seriously with a lisp? <laughs> He's worked on it, though. Since then. It was worse before? It was oh, worse before, Oh, Sora? yeah, yeah. Like oh. I said, you, there's a lot of work that goes into preparing people to come on to... I think, Van, I think, Van, I mean, listen, not to not that we want to spend the afternoon talking not, about. Yes, him, let's not, you know, Pascal. Yeah. Right. But I mean, <laughs> to, to, to reduce it, he just represents a typical kind of careerist neoliberal. I call them Negro liberal posturing of a lot of people who want to use diversity to leverage themselves more effectively in the uh, hierarchy of the ruling class. I mean, that's just the bottom line, man. He's you know, he's a different type of race pimp. Here, here. Well said. <laughs> Dylan says he backs you, you on this story. Dylan, Dylan came in. Uh, we had a we had a, a Patreon conversation about uh, this experience because Sora had I met Dylan through Sora, um, and we had a on Patreon part of a, a podcast Dylan and I did. I asked him about this this encounter with Van or these encounters with Van Jones because I forget how me and Sora started talking about it. And uh, don't let this demeanor fool you. This woman is mean. She's not mean at all. She's perfectly charming. She's very very kind. She's giving us thought provoking questions and answers. And she's she, not oh, I've seen her yell at her kids. I mean, that's oh, that's what yeah. good teachers do. I mean, I'm hey. being a good mom. <laughs> oh, your own kids, not your Our own kids. Never mind. I take that back. Not like Kirk Franklin, though. <laughs> no, I think Paul. <laughs> Paul She's a... like, Sora's like, what are you talking about? I mean, you know, I have no idea. You don't know Kirk Franklin? Inter internal cultural humor. There was an audio of Kirk Franklin, who was a famous gospel singer preacher as well uh cursing at his 33 year old son and it's like some crazy it's like insane like sanford and son level like cursing with like you know all kinds of nonsense like boy i'll break your neck you know i made you i mean it's just he just he's just going all, it's very non-preacherly non-gospel christiany type of speaking of i mean that. didn't pascal go to school with salt and pepper no i didn't go to <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring I up see, last show. I see, I, see the, I see the Jacobin Schmick has got jokes right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Sora, before you go, before you go, we have to give you uh, a dose of. We don't, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to get into that, but we're just going to hit you with some black shit. By the way, Sora came with me to go see Friday. Ah. Do you remember that? Like in theaters. In theaters, yes. yes. I think it was yeah. me, you, and Will Lou. Me, so, you, your sister, and Will Lou. You know, I was I just thinking, I'm like, oh, they're nature. showing it again in theaters? They're rerunning it? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but, man, I got to go see the head. Nice. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Hold on. I got I found it. I found it. Oh, no. Can you guys see that? Oh, no. Walker, what are, what are you going to show? 
Hold on. <laughs> That's God's love. That's God's love. I will break your neck, nigga. That's God's love. Wow. <laughs> right. I mean, as, he said, as, I, he said as, I dare as, you. Yeah, as as a being raised in a Christian household, that is how I experience God's love. <laughs> <laughs> is that not oh. how? Is that not? <laughs> That is what God you hear, intended. You hear yes, one uh, thing, and you hear one thing Sunday morning, and you get a whole other thing the whole rest of the week. That's, I mean, Sunday morning is New Testament, and at home is Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> the fire and brimstone. <laughs> oh, I, I had to talk my oldest son, uh, who actually is a really good kid. He <laughs> at one point got out of line with me, and I told him I could break his neck. Well, yeah, I told myself I get up in the morning and exercise every day so I can stay in shape to fuck you up. Mm. <laughs> Let him know. Let him know. <laughs> get ready, go night, night. Too. Like, just so you know, little nigga, I wow. get ready. I wait for the day when you want to. <laughs> Never <laughs> stop being prepared to put your ass to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I don't know. I'm not gonna say the guy's name, but. We have a, a friend from from school that his dad he got out of line with his dad and his dad punched him in the chest, uh, and he said his dad punched him so hard in the chest that he felt that the life. <laughs> why why are we encouraging all of this kind of verbal and physical abuse <laughs> of the children? I mean, we're not encouraging it. I don't know where uh, <laughs> just letting it be known. Testimony yeah. to our own experiences. Right. I'm <laughs> speaking my truth. I'm speaking my truth. <laughs> I mean, I, I, growing up in an, in an anti-Christian communist household, I had a version of that. So it's not completely unfamiliar. Wow. So you were getting spanked with Miles Red Book? Is that what you think? <laughs> 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 That's right. That's right. To his dad, my dad's like, you got to have a principle. So yes, it's not it's not unfamiliar, not unfamiliar. But um, say, who recorded me yelling at my son? The principal is uh whoop that ass. That's the one principle of communism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. So. Oh shit. So apparently Ben Dixon's coming on in like uh, a little less than twenty minutes, and that poor man is walking into some shit. Does he know what he's walking into? I, I guess. Know. Has he has he watched the show yet? Or some uh, leftist you know, ass ass the leftist ass right. niggas talking pots. Right. <laughs> Schmigga Saturday. Schmigga Saturday. Right. I, so until I played that clip, real talk, I hadn't heard this Kurt Franklin shit. I hadn't heard anything I, about I, it. I never heard it either. But but you know who Kurt Franklin is, right, Paul? Yeah. Okay. I love how uh, I'm just the young guy. You think I don't know anything. I do, but that's fine. Because who knows, <laughs> Kurt Franklin, that's old black but people. This is, but you, there's something really, really deep in that, right? This exposure between what goes on in the privacy of one's home or sort of behind the you know Zoom screen mm -hmm. um, or outside of the Zoom box. And then how we present ourselves when we're engaging that that's some it's not unlike what you were talking before we talking about earlier which is um you know that comment made by the the sort of public relations sort of police officer i can't remember what position he actually had who you know said that the that long was just having a bad day right that mm -hmm. the slip of who we actually are in our private lives that comes out in a discourse that explains a lot about what 
you know, we're able to do politically what we're, what we're able to imagine politically. Um, that it's, it's another piece of evidence about how, you know, part of this terrain of struggle is precisely those privatized spaces. And I, and I just don't know in this moment, in this sort of technology media moment, this completely um, sort of neoliberal moment where capital dominates all, right? Whether it exposing it is helpful in any way, shape or form. That's an interesting question is that, you know, in the, in the age of digital technology, does uh, this private space even exist? Can it exist, right? No, because his son snitched him out. We always talking about snitch, snitch. Ain't nobody snitching. That motherfucker snitched his daddy the fuck out. <laughs> I'm going to put your ass on World Star, daddy. Take that, church man. And, and even to play off what you're saying, Sora, was like, also combined with that in the digital space, we have this kind of Instagramification of life that everyone wants to be like, you know, you know, Take, you know, strike a pose, take a picture. Right. And that plays you out know, kind of in... like. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, sorry. Ask Pascal Oscar. was freezing. I, I didn't. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but I was saying that plays out. I mean, going back to, you know, non-profitization of, of movements and like, you know, obviously social media is a, a tool that can be used for organizing. We've seen it be used in different ways, but like it also allows people to just claim leadership by just being on social media or using it in a certain way. And I mean, I'd be interested to talk with Ben about this more and everyone when it comes to Black Lives Matter, but it's like, I mean, Adolph Reed has said this all the time, like whoever can get out, get in front of a camera is a leader. And then you have DeRay McKesson, great example. He was able to pose as the leader um, without really having to prove or really show that is true. And I, I know I brought this up when I was here last weekend, but take someone like A. Philip Randolph, who was not really seen as a, quote, Black leader or labor leader until mm -hmm. after he organized the Porters, which was a Herculean mm -hmm. task. It took him 12 years to do that. Yeah. Only then, when he had proven, I have a constituency that I, I've helped to organize, is he seen as a leader? And it's like, whereas, De, you know, DeRay, he runs for mayor and gets something like 1%, which exposes <laughs> that however popular you're on on social media, what, what is your base? Um, so, I mean, mm -hmm. and I think that plays out a lot in this like nonprofit organizing is like when it's social media driven, you kind of get to just like pose as a leader very easily, but you know, where, what, you know, where's the substance of what you've delivered or what your base is having to show that you have a base through organizing. That's something nonprofits don't really, don't really do. Have you heard the old Langston Hughes quote? Oh, uh, black man in a suit will, with every $10 in his pocket. With $5 in his pocket and a new suit could be a black leader. Right. Damn. And yeah, I mean, so Paul, the question has been, yeah. Now, what if, now, what now, what, what, is, what is it now? But how do you, how do you change that for to any, any Negro with, I mean, uh, good Wi-Fi and a podcast? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, good Wi-Fi is that, is that, <laughs> you is that something that we're preparing men for? Answer answer for this. Is this what the secret is? Because I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, you have no idea who Ben Dixon is, huh? I don't. I I am not he, really on. Yeah, I'm not on the sort of social media sort of yet. Really. Reading the books, doing the research, writing the articles. Yeah. He is watching the Kardashians. <laughs> I mean, Paul, you're suggesting, you know, you're asking the question of like, is it possible for us to create spaces where we have a leaderless or anti-leader social mobilization? Yeah. Well, what, what kind of energy enables that? And I think right. that there are, are examples of that, but I, I, it's I don't a quite, very urgent but, thing you're- Yeah, I don't uh -huh. quite believe in leaderlessness. I'm just saying like a leader, I, I actually believe that there has to be some kind of leadership, but I think a leadership that's accountable or has shown legitimate reasons to be a leader or, or is recognized by, or is the constituency. Chosen by the constituency. Right. Or I mean, a great example is like, I mean, Randolph repeatedly won elections in the brother of sleeping car porters 
And so it's fine. I don't, I'm not saying the union should not have had a leadership. They should have, but I'm saying like he has shown that and the, to be recognized as a black leader, leader, he could point to the results of the Fair Employment Practices Commission, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. It's like, you know, that's what I've done. That's what I've been a part of. So I'm not really even a mm-hmm. believer in like leaderlessness in that sense, but I'm just saying like, the leader has to be tied to a base and to some achievements yeah. to point to, you know, I, mm-hmm. I'm about to, mm-hmm. I was about to say something real spicy, but I don't know. Go for it. Let's, mm, go for it. This, this is, is where you can be spicy. Here's the thing. Okay. So this is the question I asked about someone like Malcolm X because not to ignore the power that he had and as a symbol. And Here, comes especially the someone... Here comes the mulatto schmigga. <laughs> Let, hear me out. Hear me out. It, 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 I mean, it's not even like an anti-Malcolm X thing, but I'm saying like when we think of him as a leader, clearly, you know, his ability to art- articulate what was going on and as a voice and a symbol. But again, what was the legacy in terms of achievements or an organized base? You know, I mean, we can look at the legacy of a, the Civil Rights New Deal period, and we can criticize that, but we can point to the concrete achievements. With Malcolm X, it's like, I mean, while he was with the nation, and we all know that he evolved over time, and that should be recognized, but spent most of his time criticizing the Civil Rights Movement and the people that were risking their lives and, and getting killed in the struggle. And he eventually comes around to actually believing, no, like we need to be in the struggle. By the very end of his life, he's supporting, you know, the uh, movement in Selma for the Voting Rights Act. And it's like, all right, I mean, by the end of your life, you came around to the position that people had been at and been fighting and and been winning. You know, that I mean, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying like, oh, I hate we, Malcolm X, but we, like, how, how do we evaluate him as a leader compared to others we, who... Sorry, go ahead. Kwame Ture is ready. Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael's uh, Ready for Revolution, he suggests in the book that towards the end of his life that uh, Malcolm X was actually considering a, a union with SNCC, that he was actually yeah. trying to move in the direction of uh, working with right and in, I- uh, institutions in the traditional civil rights movement. But to ask you what was his legacy, I would argue that. Malcolm X directly is the uh, ideological father of what becomes the Black Panther Party. Right. In that, that, you know, his his uh, his arguments towards internationalism, his art, his arguments towards self defense, and his actual uh, theorization of uh, Black revolutionary, international revolutionary uh, solidarity is something that becomes manifested in the Black Panther Party. Now, if we want to argue whether or not that is a policy legacy that we should, you know, uh, regard as significant, that's another debate. But I would not make the argument that Malcolm X does not have a legacy in terms of affecting uh, Black social and political activity, uh, even after his death. I would say it's a different type of legacy than the traditional civil rights movement. But if we're going to use that to say, what was his legacy? Well, we can say the same thing about Hubert Harrison. We can say the same thing about, you know, there's a variety. I think all those questions should be asked, you know? You know, there are a variety of. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There are a variety of figures, of black left or not even left, who have been important in terms of you know black politics and black radical politics, who may not have necessarily gotten the political administration at that time to change the status quo, but at the same time, did they leave an ideological foundation for people who followed them? to take their ideas to really, really challenge politics. I mean, at the same time, you could say Hubert Harrison did not, uh, you know, change politics per se, but Harrison, you know, you know, guided many people, many Blacks to socialism. I mean, his importance, I think, is significant. So I, 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 I'm I, not saying I disagree with your analysis, Paul, what I'm saying is I don't know if you want to use that as a barometer to uh, to judge historical figures. I'm up for debate debate on that. Uh, I was I don't know how me and Tere were talking about this. I think he said was a third good marshal towards the end of his his when he was retiring he was asked something about Malcolm X. He said he, he said, doesn't yeah he said he doesn't understand why he's considered a great black man a great black leader. Yeah, 
Well, thank you, Dr. Han, for finally coming on the show. Um, it, I haven't physically seen you, but seeing you, this is my first time seeing you on any sort of screen in probably four years. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to count now, but um, thank you all for having me. This was one of the yeah. most honest discussions I've had about recent events, but also about how we really kind of forge spaces to think revolution, enact revolution um, with a lot of, with a lot of um, humor and uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's Will, Will Luce. It was everything that I was hoping it would be. <laughs> so Will says, what's up? Oh, that's Coach Will. Hey, Coach yeah. Will. That's Will. Yeah. Um, I look forward to talking with you all again. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it wasn't too painful. No, it was absolutely enjoyable, and I think you're asking all the right questions, and, and I'm just honored that you would include me in it.